Hello again, this is Rosalind speaking and we're here to talk about Notre Dame Cathedral, Our Lady of Paris. On the evening of April the 15th, 2019, the beloved Notre Dame de Paris burnt in a devastating fire. She blazed for 15 hours while the world watched in shock as more than 800 years of history was destroyed in one evening. Our Lady de Paris was part Romanesque and part Gothic, and she is situated in the fourth arrondissement on the island of Ile de Cit in Paris. That night, her tremendous spire collapsed. Most of the roof was destroyed with the upper walls severely damaged. The timbers were made of 5,000 oak trees and were hundreds of years old, and they're gone. While much has been saved, what made things worse was the lead that covered the wooden roof melted and made the site contaminated, leaving the environment a challenge to work with. Miraculously, the famous and renowned 14th century Gothic life-size sculpture, the Virgin of Paris, was saved. Also, the cathedral altar, two pipe organs, and its three 13th century rose windows all suffered little to no damage. A law has been handed down by the French National Assembly that Notre Dame must be restored to the cathedral's historic and architectural splendour. And it was with immense hope that this will be achieved in 2024. Let us hope that this intention and law be fulfilled. With all this devastation, we at Sacred Spirit Tours felt a strong pull to shine a light on this sacred site with an intention of strengthening her re-emergence from these fires. Like a phoenix out of the ashes, her strength never diminishes by the changing of form, not only in this moment, but throughout history. Let us go back to before this grand lady was constructed. The divine, feminine aspect of the infinite has been called on in this area for thousands of years. The very first church, Saint Germain du Prez, was built 1.5 kilometres away from Notre Dame, the Great Lady of Paris and according to Ian Beck, was built over an original temple dedicated to Isis. Situated on the Isle Ildesit, she was built by the Merovingians around 512 Common Era. It was said to have been founded by Childebert I, and the site became known as the 6th century Benedictine Abbey, and later in the 10th century, the Abbey became a cathedral. There is nothing left now of the Abbey except for the later addition of a Romanesque designed church. This cathedral still holds the title of the oldest place of worship in Paris. There is an unfinished statue in Saint Germain de Prez called the Virgiane Sauvignance, Mary softly smiling. She's from 13th century, around 1250 CE and she's made of stone. She was lost for a while, buried for eight centuries. She was found not far on an archaeological dig in 1999. She now has pride in place in the church. The Basilica and Cathedral of Saint-Étienne in Paris, also on the Lille de la Cité, was thought to be opposite and in front of Notre Dame. This was early Christian church that paved the way for Notre Dame de Paris. Again, there are many dates associated to the church's first construction, mostly thought to be built in the 4th century, or during Childebert's reign in the 5th century. Archaeology has found that it was also built over earlier Roman foundations of either a villa or a temple. Considering that 1.5 kilometres away, the temple to Isis is verified. These remains could possibly be something else. Nothing remains above the ground of the original cathedral, and nothing is known of its outside appearance. 
the only thing for us to view is a plaque in the ground revealing where it once was. It was dismantled in about 1163 when the construction began on Notre Dame de Paris. This church was created and has been remodelled architecturally over the years in the style of Merovingian, Carolingian and Romanesque. Underneath her lies a treasure trove of archaeology. It is thought that as many as four churches were on this site originally. One is thought to be from the Merovingian era, which we would say is from 457 to 750 Common Era. The other from the Carolingian era, which is from 780 to 900. And what we mostly see today is the remains of the Romanist period, which is from 1075 to about 1100 Common Era. Yet under all this is a temple that the Gallio Romans built, and it was dedicated to Jupiter. The Gallio Romans had a presence here from about 58 BCE and would have worshipped Jupiter and potentially other deities as well as performing rituals and ceremonies. Even back further, before the Romans, were the Gauls, a Celtic tribe originating from continental Europe were inhabitants of this region. This is roughly from about 500 BCE to 500 Common Era, so about a thousand years. While it is unknown what sort of construction they built, we know that from other archaeological sites that they created sacred sites and executed traditional practices that honoured life cycles. Evidence of the Celts is present here and it was found as early as the 1700s. On the 6th of March 1710, during a construction of the crypt under the nave in Notre Dame de Paris, a pillar was found and it appeared to have been reused in the 4th century city walls, which they built to endeavour to protect the inhabitants from the barbarian attacks and invasions. The pillar is called the Pillar of the Boatman, or Pilier di Nort. It is a monumental Roman column. While it was erected to honour Jupiter, the inscription mingles Roman deities with gods that are distinctly Gaelic. The pillar which was also the oldest monument in Paris, was donated in the first century, and the name of the pillar reflected that guild, the Guild of Boatmen. The Roman name for this pillar was Notte Parisi, which means the sailors of Parisi, who were the tribe of the Gauls. Clearly evidence that the Celts were here. The pillar can be seen today in the Frigidarium of Thermes de Cluny. In more modern times, while sticking in 1965 to 1972, archaeologists continue to find a treasure trove of history, including part of a wharf, a port of the ancient Gauls, the ancient Parisi tribe, in the city they called Lutres, which is now modern day Paris. This is most likely where the name Paris came from. It is interesting to note that the Ile de Cite was formed when a few smaller islands were artificially merged in the first century Common Era. Archaeologists found coins from the Gauls era. Their names were etched on them. And these dated from about the time of Emperor Augustus, around 27 BCE. They also found the remains of a gallo roman public bathhouse. Another layer of remains are the medieval streets of Paris. An old street made way for new streets and this made way for the new cathedral. The 19th century modern era of sewers was evident in the street systems and interestingly enough, after testing showed indications that several epidemics had regularly passed through this city. Construction of Notre Dame de Paris began around 1163 Common Era and was completed 1260 Common Era. The design was the brainchild of the Paris Bishop at the time, Maurice de Sully. Over the centuries, she has had many modifications, yet what is clear is her perpetual connection to her past to the sacredness of this site. While there are clear reflections of seeking divinity in this site, 
We can also observe this reflection in so many aspects of this cathedral, how she was constructed and what elements were created to honour God were inspired and breathtaking. The ribbed vaults, first demonstrated by the Romans as a method to create framework across exceptionally large spaces, seem to miraculously convey the load downwards. In a similar way, the flying buttresses used to support structures seemed inexplicable as they seemed to hover rather than contact the wall at ground level. The hope is that these will all be restored to their full glory. Her majestic stained glass windows were created to inform the pilgrim coming to the sacred site. She has three rose windows. The west rose window is 10 meters in diameter and dates from 1220 CE. It is the most famous as it has most of its original glass the story in the stained glass is a reflection on the human side of life, including the zodiac labors in the months of the working year. Twelve prophets surround the Virgin, and there are twelve virtues represented by twelve crowned noble women. Viewed from the outside is the statue of the Virgin and Child with angels. This is also called the Feast of Roses for the important role women played in earlier Christianity. The knights who constructed the building paid great homage to women who were called Our Lady, and soon it became a habit to use the word rosary. Originally, some of the girls in May would choose a knight to crown with a rosary of roses. To me, it would be very unusual to make this gesture as the knights were celebrate. To the Arabs and Franks, the rose was the flower of love. Petal by petal, it unveils the heart Somewhere this changed to an offering of roses being Hail Mary to the Mother of Christ, and this change is said to be around the 13th century, now called the Litanies of Mary, the Mystical Rose. This rose window was donated by the Queen Blanche of Castile, who was the mother of Saint Louise the King. The South Rose window is 12.9 metres in diameter and was a gift from King St. Louis. Made around 1270 Common Era, it consists of 84 panels, and this rosette, as it's sometimes called, is dedicated to the New Testament. Throughout this south rose are representations of the symbolic number four. The original centerpiece of this window was of Christ in majesty. At some point, it was replaced with the coat of arms of a cardinal. Below it is the 16 prophets representing the heavenly court. The four great prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel, carrying the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Further, the window has numerous depictions including the twelve apostles, twenty angels all carrying candles and crowns, wise virgins, saints and martyrs such as Saint Denis holding his head, Marguerite and her dragon, the life of Matthew and in the top corner is Mary Magdalene and John. The North Rose window is 12.9 metres in diameter and was built from 1250 to 1260 Common Era by Jean de Chelles when he was architect for the cathedral. Its central medallion is of the Virgin enthroned holding the Christ Child. Surrounding them are images of kings and prophets of the Old Testament. All these stained glass windows 
have remained miraculously intact after the recent fire. Unfortunately, a layer of lead powder now rests on them, contaminating them. Testing has identified that restoration will be a mammoth task, not only to ensure the safety of the restorers, but also the precious pieces themselves. Each piece of glass needs to be cleaned five times for the glass to be deemed safe again. The spire of Notre Dame de Paris was located above a cross section of the cathedral's transept. The original was built from about 1220 to 1230. It was 78 metres or 256 feet from the floor of the church to the point of the spire and all the weight rested on the four pillars of the transept. It also functioned as the bell tower. In March 1606, a large cross section of the top of the spire with all the relics in it fell during bad weather. The remainder of this original spire collapsed in the mid 18th century and was fully taken down in 1786. A replacement spire was put in place by French architect Eugène volet Ladoux. The recent fires destroyed this spire. Surrounding this spire were statues of 12 apostles. These were made in the 13th century. Each of the four sections of the roof had a row of three apostles standing one behind each other. In front of each group was another statue in the sign of a tetramorph, a symbolic arrangement of four different elements that makes one unit. These were symbolizing the four evangelists and demonstrated the bull for St. Luke, the lion for St. Mark, the eagle for St. John, and an angel for St. Matthew. Each group of three faced the four directions, except for St. Thomas, patron saint of architects. He is positioned looking towards the spire, seemingly contemplating it. This together with a plaque at the base of the central support beam that's inscribed with a compass and a tri-square, indicating an acknowledgement of the creators and of the architect, Volet de Duc, and more noticeably maybe a reminder that God's role is the great architect of the universe and it is theorised that both architects were Freemasons. The 16 statues around the spire had been taken down four days before the fire and they were sent off to be restored. Atop of this second spire was placed a rooster weighing around 30 kilograms, 66 pound. It contained three relics, a small piece of the crown of thorns, a relic from Saint Denis, and a relic of Saint Genevieve, two of Paris's most cherished saints. A piece of the crown of thorns was put into the rooster by Volet Leduc in 1860. The archbishop hoped it would help make Paris safe from storms and from lightning. Miraculously, the rooster was found intact under the rubble the day following the fires. It was damaged, but recoverable. However, the fate of the three holy items that were in the rooster remained in doubt because the sculpture had been smashed in. The two towers standing 226 feet or 69 meters tall on its facade were built from about 1160 in the Gothic style. Visitors came to climb the 387 steps to the top and could see the spire and the bell tower, the flying buttresses, vaulting and spiral staircase, and the cathedral's guardians, the gargoyles. They also enjoyed a magnificent view over Paris. Almost all European main cities have a colossal cathedral made of stone, but what makes the Paris cathedral a bit more famous and mysterious is the novel from Victor Hugo. The Hunchback of Notre Dame. It is said that the inspiration for his story was a trapdoor in the ceiling that leads to the bell tower, and I'm sure everyone knows this tale. Hugo hoped that his novel would spark the rebirth of a building, and surely it did. The government committed to its restoration in 1842, and Eugène Follet de Duc, then having already established his reputation as an expert in restoring medieval buildings, entered and won the government competition to restore Our Lady. 
Volet Leduc shared the same passion as Hugo with a vision of breathing new life into her, something that vanished during the French Revolution. And then we have her bells vibrating across the land, echoing Notre Dame's strength and potency, inviting all to come to this sacred place. She has had many bells over the centuries. While she has both main bells and secondary bells, the 19th century bells atop the northern towers were melted down and recast into new bronze bells in 2013 to celebrate the building's 850th anniversary. They were designed to recreate the sound of the cathedral's original bells from the 17th century. The extent of any damage to the bells and their support structure is currently unclear. On the first anniversary of this devastating fire, the single remaining and famous 17th century bell in the cathedral's south tower, known as Le Bourdon, rang out at 8 p.m. We have no doubt that in the future, the echo of all her bells will one day call for all to come again to be in her sacred presence. And now let's not forget my favourite feature of Notre Dame, the gargoyles. Let me introduce Strade in English, um, Rege in French. Perpetually, these gargoyles look over Paris. The statues have been on the cathedral since 1240 CE, and they have undergone many repairs over the years, with the latest being in the early 1900s. The gargoyles usually show fierce teeth, monsters or dragon-like features. But this little fellow just looks like he's a little bit bored with it all. And he's my favorite. The population in the 11th century was mostly illiterate. So images such as these were important to communicate a message, an idea that you enter the church under the protection of the gargoyles. However, the main objective is to catch the excess water on the building not unlike our modern day guttering. As rain water runs down the roof, the water is funneled into a gargoyle and often out via the mouth, preventing water from running down the walls and interior of the cathedral. Ancient Egyptian, the Etruscans, Roman and Greeks used animal type water spouts on their temples as well. Interestingly, the gargoyles depicted some version of dragon, which is often the representation of France. Before the fire, there were many reports that they were already unsafe and in disrepair. After the fire, their whereabouts are unknown, yet it is known that some of the gargoyles were damaged. So the fate of our Strade or Frege and his friends is still undetermined. The first playing instrument mentioned in Notre Dame was as early as 1357. A new organ was built in 1403 and this was in place with many changes and extensions until the cathedral's restoration programs of the 1730s began. The present organ was originally built in 1730 to 1733 with further changes and additions in 1783 to 1788. It has undergone numerous ongoing changes including its sound quality. Yet in 1990 to 92, a large-scale restoration began, returning the organ to its symphonic character of the 19th century. In 2012 to 2014, the organ with 8,000 pipes was restored again and enlarged. Together with the great acoustics of the cathedral, the organ is said to sound incredibly beautiful, with its power being beyond imagination. The great organ, the voice of Notre Dame, 
was barely scathed by the fires or the enormous amounts of water used to extinguish the flames. However, it was laden with lead dust, requiring a meticulous clean. The statue of Notre Dame de Paris, or the Virgin of the Pillar, is a near life-size stone statue, 1.8 metres tall, of the Virgin and Child. It was sculpted in the 14th century and was originally located in the Santinho Chapel, located in the former Cloister of the Canons on the Ile de la Cite. In 1818, she was transferred to Notre Dame, where she was first placed over the mantle of the Portal of the Virgin, replacing the 13th century Virgin which was destroyed in 1793. In 1855, during the restoration campaign of Gelé le Duc, it was installed in its current location at the southeast pillar of the transept. This specific site in the cathedral was meaningful, being the same place where an altar to the Virgin had stood at the end of the 12th century. The Virgin of the Pillar was spared from fire and debris despite being directly under the vault which partly collapsed. The high altar at Notre Dame has a white marble statue or sculpture called the Virgin Cradling Jesus Body. The 1725 Pieta statue called Descent from the Cross by Nicolas Cousteau remained intact after the fire. It was surrounded by rubble and covered in ash. Also, the cross behind the altar remained intact. Notre Dame is also famous for having the crown of thorns and a golden casket, a container full of relics. And from the cathedral's website, within this container are the artefacts used in the Passion of Christ. What it is said to contain is a piece of the cross that had been preserved in Rome, a nail from the wooden cross, a holy sponge that would have been soaked in vinegar and offered to Christ to drink from during his crucifixion, the teeth of Saint Genevieve, the hair of a saint, and the mandolin, a square piece of cloth with the image of Jesus on it the tunic of St. Louis was also saved. Jean-Marc Fournier, the chaplain at the Paris Fire Brigade, risked his life to save the controversial crown of thorns. He entered fearlessly into the 850-year-old cathedral and he grabbed the two ancient relics, the crown of thorns and the golden casket, and he got out. The tunic of St. Louis and the other relics and the artwork were also saved that night. A true hero, a mortal man, someone prepared to die for his faith and belief. I know that the mystery for me, and I'm always asking, is how did he get to know where these sacred relics were? And, and also how did the relics of the crown of thorns get from Jerusalem to France? Well, the story goes that in 1238 CE, King Baldwin II, who was the Latin Emperor of Constantinople, was trying to gather troops to join his domain and support him. In his inducement, he offered them to King Louis IX, who was the King of France, who said yes, and stored them away in a golden chest in the treasury of his purpose-built Saint Chapelle in Paris. This, I must add, has been very heavily disputed over for centuries, as other churches claim to have the crown as well. So I guess the jury is still out on this issue. Another story is that the Latin Emperor Baldwin II needed money and was said to have pawned the crown of thorns to a Venetian merchant bank for credit. Then King Louis IX of France paid the bank and took the relics. An undershirt, believed to have belonged to King Louis, was added to the collection of relics some time after his death, and it was worn during the 13th century.
Many have their last resting place at this sacred site within the embrace of the Grand Lady. Notre Dame does not have the usual crypt. Burials here were either straight into the floor of the church or in an above ground sarcophagus, a requirement for burials in the medieval period. Sadly, there is no surviving records of who was buried here. Many renovations of Notre Dame over the years have exposed many burials. Some have been moved and buried in common tombs and burial vaults. Those burials found in the choir area and the nave during the 1771 renovations were left intact below a repaved floor with black and white tiles covering the tombs and keeping them safe. They remain holding space during the next renovations, unfolding as we speak. I think we all know where we were when we heard the sad news about Our Lady Notre Dame de Paris being ablaze. I know the day and night well. It was the day my mother died. I ponder these events wondering for a deeper message, a deeper significance to the merging of such profound events. What does it mean for me personally to have also lost my mother on that day? What does it mean for all of us? Notre Dame de Paris is said by some to represent the throat chakra. Did she burn to reveal truth to the world? To facilitate the speaking of truth? Her form will change again and again as it has done throughout millennia. Yet her intention is always pure. Her sacredness and perpetual presence and her potency will never be diminished. So let us gather our thoughts and prayers and acknowledge her. Be present with her as we pick up the task of facilitating her changing form. Let us not forget the marshy lands of the Celts where it all began. Let us recall the women being honoured here, the divine feminine celebrated and respected here, the temple of Isis calling the faithful, the temple of Jupiter granting blessings of abundance, Medieval peoples avoiding puddles as they stroll along the early roads to reach the sacred ground. This has not changed. Only the form has changed. The infinite gifts remain the same. Eternally gifting all who come bearing themselves and connecting to divinity in this sacred place. The presence of the divine feminine here will always be. Whether it is amongst the grandest form we can create or under a tree deemed as a meeting place. And so it is.